Um, and uh, before we get started uh, with our speakers, I would like to uh, just throw out a couple of announcements. Uh, so uh, next week we have a science on tap, a virtual science on tap. Um, and that will be by Julia Parrish from the School of Aquatic and Fishery Science uh, program at the University of Washington. And her talk is entitled COVID Clouds and Silver Linings, the Value of Sci Citizen Science in a Pandemic. Uh, and again, that will be uh, on Wednesday, August 19th at 6 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Uh, and I'll also include the, a link to uh, that uh, Science on Tap in the chat uh, once we get started. Um, also, uh, next week we have a special seminar speaker. Um, we have Carmel Finley uh, from Oregon State University, who is a science historian. Uh, she will be uh, presenting a uh, giving a talk on Bell Shimada's journey from 1921 to 1958. Uh, this, uh, she'll be talking about her paper that examines the overlooked contribution of Japanese scientists to ocean science and the development of recruitment fisheries oceanography, defined as the impact of the environment on the annual production of young fish stocks. It, also draws it will also draw attention to the pre-war work of Japanese scholars engaged in the study of equatorial and North Pacific Ocean. Uh, and again, that will be next week at the same time uh, for that, that seminar speaker. Um, if you need more information or links to our upcoming events, uh, you wanna check out our HMSC homepage and scroll to the bottom for details. And I'll put that link also in the chat. There you go. Okay, so with all of that uh, in place and uh, accounted for, uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, we've got kind of a two-parter today. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Eric Meitz, is a lecturer and researcher at the University of Aruba with a keen interest in program design for sustainable development in small island states. He is co-founder and coordinator of the Sustainable Island Solutions Through Science. Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics system uh, project. Um, and it's a cluster um, uh, at the University of Aruba. He's also co-founder and coordinator of the Academic Foundation Year and facilitates and initiates international students, uh, international student research exchange programs. And with that, Eric. Okay. Uh... Thank you. Can you all see my PowerPoint now, Yichung? We can. Oh, wonderful. Okay, I'll keep this very short because tonight is not about me, but about Diana Melville's uh, contribution, of course. And it is uh, a pleasure for me to first introduce the project within which Diana is doing her work. Um, three years ago, we were at Hatfields to uh, give information about what we were doing and to start establishing a link between the two institutes, Hatfield Marine Sciences and, uh, Center and the University of Aruba. And at that time, we were setting up the system projects. As uh, Ichung indicated, the system project stands for Sustainable Island Solutions through Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. And that tells you a lot about it because it's about sustainable development, sustainable island solutions, and about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, why islands? Because islands are very specific contextualized uh, research environments, but also small island states face very specific challenges. And what you're seeing here is actually a combination of challenges in Aruba, where you see our landfill, for example, at this point of time, this is a couple of years ago, being on fire uh, right over the mangroves and uh, you see the sailing boats next to it and the fishing industry next to it and you can also imagine the coral reefs next to uh, that uh, open fire. This is a fire that was uh, car tires by the way. Uh, this is all human impact on uh, island uh, states. But we also have, well, nature going on. This is a picture of Hurricane Irma in September 2017, and the consequences of this hurricane have still not been overcome by states like 
Dominica, uh, Saint Martin, uh, the Puerto Rico, and many others. Right now, we have COVID-19 going on. We don't know what is next, but the challenge for small island states is that we have big issues coping with this kind of major scale challenges. And this is not helped by the fact that small island states, for example, the Caribbean uh, small island states, all have historically, uh, but also politically diverse, diverse backgrounds that also make sure that we have different kinds of academia, different kinds of research traditions, and different kinds of socio-economic networks. So if we want to achieve sustainable development goals by 2030, we need to do a big job. But there are quite some challenges for research for sustainable development in small island states. And if you can see, I put a D between brackets because I'm not a strong believer in the fact that we're all developing because the whole world is developing and it shouldn't set us apart. Um, and the first reason for that is that purely academic solutions or purely academic research, I should say, uh, is often not recognized by the governing bodies of these island states. And at the same time, the ready-made as offered by consultancy firms uh, often refers to solutions or approaches that better fit large continental states, but not small island states. Taps into the third thing is that scale, of course, dictates that we do not have the research capacity to tackle all challenges that we face. And on the other hand, we often forget about the existing local expertise that we have uh, when it comes to the context, when it comes to the way in which you can successfully implement projects, and when it comes to the history uh, of the social and geographical and natural ecosystems history of these islands. In order to be successful with such a kind of project, uh, when you want to overcome challenges, you need to have insights into the culture of the island states. You have to be uh, experienced in inter intercultural communication. You have to be aware of uh, different um, frameworks of perspective and perception. And you have to tap into the multidisciplinary needs. That's why we set up the system project, which consists of a Bachelor of Science, a three year bachelor program in which students can follow a specialization in bioenvironmental engineering or in informatics and data sciences or in technology and engineering. Uh, 2022, we start with a master of science for sustainable development in small island states. But we also set up a research institute for sustainable development in small island states that at this, this moment hosts eight PhD candidates. Uh, we have funding for 11, so uh, in the upcoming months, we will be looking for three more candidates. And the number of projects that is attaching to this cluster is growing. So in the upcoming six months, we expect two more uh, larger funding drives to come through to further expand what we're doing. Last but not least, uh, we're also setting up a sustainable small island states repository dissemination and outreach center so that what we create is not lost. The goals of this is that we have education in uh, science, technology, and engineering, of course. We create a STEM knowledge base. We develop research capacity, services, and products. We increase the University of Aruba positioning in Aruban society. We expand the network, and we fill in, of course, the government of Aruba's education, research, and innovation policy, and contribute uh, and collaborate in the achievement of the sustainable development goals. At this moment, we do that from the University of Aruba in collaboration, in very close collaboration with the KU Leuven. KU Leuven is the host uh, institute, also the promoter institute for the PhD projects. Um, project supervision is done by KU Leuven and UNDP. Funding, the main funding for the first three years of the project comes from the EU and um, the, uh, the, the government of Aruba is of course a very important other funder for this project. What's missing in this picture is quite a number of other uh, logos of institutes and one of the important ones for us is Oregon State University of course and Hatfield Marine Sciences Center and that is why Ichung and I are actually currently working on further establishing collaboration. So, as I promised, 
I would keep this short and I'd rather introduce Diana who is going to give a talk about her research project that she's currently setting up and Diana is uh, she recently joined the University of Aroba and KU Leuven, which is a university in Belgium, quite a large one too, as a sandwich PhD candidate and as an instructor of biology. She is originally from Trinidad and Tobago, where she completed her Bachelor of Science in Zoology and Environmental and Natural Research Management at the University of the West Indies at St. Augustine. And later on, she completed her master's degree in conservation and biodiversity at the University of Exeter in the UK. Her professional career prior to her work at the UAE and KU Leuven included education and research as a marine science educator, and she has worked in this vein across several Caribbean governmental and non-governmental institutions, colleges, and other higher level institutions, all in small island nations in the Caribbean and the Pacific. Prior to joining her uh, current position, Diana was the coordinator of the Marine Science Certificate Program at the College of the Marshall Islands in Majoro, Micronesia and at the CMI she created other unique academic programs and opportunities for students that relied on the traditional knowledge of the Marshallese people as small islanders to build knowledge and capacity in the sustainable management of the marine environment. Just to tell you that I'm very happy with Diana within the framework of the system project. Currently, as a system PhD candidate, Diana's research will examine population structure and genetic connectivity of reef building corals in the southern Dutch Caribbean. And aside from that, she hopes that through her work, a greater interest in the coastal and marine environment will encourage stakeholders and non-stakeholders in the region to become more vested in the protection and sustainable development of the natural resource in the region. Outside of professional interests, Diana reads, writes, and enjoys spending time with her family. Uh, I think she will not further elaborate on that last bit, but on that what came just before that, the genetic connectivity and the population structure of reef building corals in the Southern Dutch Caribbean. Diana, I will shut up. Okay. Um, so thank you, Eric. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, fantastic. So as Eric mentioned, I am one of the eight students that are the eight PhD candidates that are currently pursuing their system PhDs under the University of Aruba in conjunction with Kyle Leuven of Belgium. And um, I'll also take this opportunity to mention that there are a variety of projects spread among um, the eight of us. So some persons within our group are working from projects that relate to sustainable waste and water management, valorization of reverse osmosis. We are also looking at vertical farming, life cycle analysis for more sustainable food chains in the Caribbean islands. So all of these projects, including mine, are really multidisciplinary and geared towards sustainable development within the Caribbean and identifies needs that are definitely relevant to a local context or a local situation. So to get into my project, I'll just begin with a little bit of background. Most of this, some of you would already know, but I will still go into it anyway, just to give some context. So as you know, coral ecosystems are pretty much sources of ecosystem services for millions worldwide, including the Caribbean. They protect our coastlines from storms and erosion, provide habitats, provide spawning nursery, grounds for economically important fish, and they even provide jobs and income to local economies. And in the Southern Dutch Caribbean, it is no different. We here, we have a very thriving marine-based tourism alone on all of the three islands that make up the Southern Dutch Caribbean. And um, we also have a wealth of biodiversity in our waters, including about 60 species of corals and 1,500 species of fish, according to the World Resources Institute. The problem is, is that about a third of Caribbean coral reefs are currently under threat by things like coastal development, sewage runoff, and all of this relates to the growing tourism industry that takes place on these three islands. Previous threats to coral reefs in the Caribbean would have been things like hurricanes, as Eric mentioned before, so we are still recovering from hurricanes that have taken place in the past. Um, we have a shift in the species dynamics due to overfishing, 
according to studies by the IUCN, and we've had major issues with bleaching events in the past, as most other coral reefs worldwide. And disease has also currently played a, well, has played a role in the past and has even come back to haunt us a bit in the form of stony tissue coral loss disease that is currently taking over many parts of the Caribbean. So the problem, as most other global coral reef space, is that it's generally de declining rapidly in health and abundance, particularly in the large dominant reef builder species such as Orbicella and Montestrea. So what we've come to understand is that population structure of corals is really shaped by this interplay, a very dynamic interplay between life history and oceanographic features. So there's been a lot of progress and research that has been made in understanding the different spatial and temporal scales of disturbances that affect these coral reefs. So you have a situation where there's like local patchy impacts from the intense storms that I mentioned before to various regional effects from overfishing, all sorts of things, racy water temperatures. But the issue is, is that our general and current understanding of scales of dispersal of coral larvae is inadequate. And I look at corals because corals are essentially the foundation of coral reefs. That is what they are in fact, they are foundation species. And if corals did not exist, pretty much you would not have any other organism existing in the coral reef environment. So this is the basis of my study. So I look at larvae because the stage of larvae in its planktonic biphasic state is such that they are the ones, the stage of the coral that is actually capable of movement. So many marine organisms have this biphasic life cycle where the planktonic larvae are produced and they are the ones that are essentially dispersed across the marine habitats. And you know, it was once thought that larvae was kind of just like blown around from place to place, but now we have a very good understanding that larvae are often very motile. They exhibit directional swimming. They are quite responsible, sorry, responsive to environmental cues, biochemical cues, etc. And they display these very specific behaviors to change how they get dispersed in the marine environment. So in its planktonic stage, as I said, they move around the ocean, they're very pelagic, they detect cues, become dispersed, and then they eventually settle and recruit in certain areas. And corals are not the only organisms, oops, sorry. <laughs> corals are not the only organisms that do this. Many marine organisms do this. In fact, 80% of them um, behave in this manner. So let me hit that play button again. And um, there's a diversity of larvae that is out there, but they've been pretty difficult to study because of the small size, the microscopic nature of these larvae that float around. They've been very hard to follow, find again. They've been very difficult to tag. And we know so much more about the adults of these species because of their large size. They are the ones that you can go out, find a coral, tag it, return to it, study it later. But in general, there's so much more about coral larvae that we don't know about. And we realize that a lot of their life history um, elements, as well as ocean hydrodynamics and other factors, contribute to their dispersal. So all of that brings me to the video that you are already seeing before you. It shows the, um, the larvae of one of our dominant species, as I mentioned before, which is Orbicella fabulata. And it shows the nature of these larvae simply swimming around on their own in a petri dish under a microscope. So on its own, you are seeing that they are exhibiting directional movement, highly motile, and it's the very nature of juveniles of these and other species that are responsible for the dispersal and hence their connectivity between marine habitats. So corals, as I mentioned before, they have a very interesting life history that allows them to be dispersed in certain ways. So they've evolved two predominant sexually reproductive strategies or modes. And one of the modes is known as broadcast spawning. Broadcasters are where the parent colonies release their eggs and sperm into the water column. The eggs and sperm mix, become fertilized, and then they 
larvae metamorphose over several weeks, swimming in the water, becoming dispersed until they finally um, listen to the different cues around them, the behavioral, physical, chemical cues that allow them to eventually settle. Meanwhile, brooding corals, they have their eggs and sperm developing, um, fertilizing and developing within the parent colony. And it's the fertilized um, version of the larvae, also known as planulae, that get released into the water column, eventually settling as well. So broadly speaking, the release and recruitment of these planulae, or larvae, as you could call them, is usually quite localized. So near the area of their parents by both brooders and broadcasters. But the, in some cases, there are slight differences. We tend to find that brooders really settle near to their parents in general, just naturally, and broadcasters, because they survive for longer times in the water column, they have higher selection pressures than them that allow them to be dispersed further. So for example, there have been studies on the Great Barrier Reef that show that most of the recruitment of corals has been local, again, particularly by brooders, who are generally more genetically subdivided as a result of this nearby recruitment than broadcasters. But you would find that enough planulae were widely dispersed to ensure that both the brooding and the broadcasting spawners kind of had very vast panmitic or mixed populations on the Great Barrier Reef. I keep making this mistake, sorry about that. All right. And further studies went on to show that, you know, broadcasting spawning corals have indicated that, well, the further studies of the broadcasting spawners in general have indicated that there's dispersal between the regions, but sometimes the dispersal between regions can often be very limited. And this limitation is often as a result of other factors or other um, other processes that take place that influence the dispersal of these organisms. And this is where I will bring in connectivity because there are a variety of different processes that influence how larvae are dispersed, apart from its behavioral and reproductive modes that influence how far they go and where they go. So connectivity is essentially the exchange of individuals among marine populations. And the exchange of individuals between different populations changes entire biological systems. So not because a place is close by, does it mean that an individual will be necessarily exchanged, exchanged. It all depends on the ease of exchange from one place to the next. And as humans, we generally have a biased opinion about the ocean in that we think is, you know, just a big bathtub and everything in is just related in terms of distance. But what we have found is that the oceans are so much more complicated and there's an entire suite of biological processes. For example, resilience to disturbance, spread of invasive species, diseases, sustainability of fisheries, et cetera. And all of these things, local biodiversity pretty much depend on. So it matters, all of these differences that I just mentioned in terms of um, the physical and biological processes, these differences also matter to the animals that live there, to the organisms that live there. And when a habitat is disturbed by one or more of these processes, again, it throws off the, the systems, the biological systems. How, when there's a hurricane, for example, how do some of these organisms come back from it? How do the corals recolonize after they've been destroyed completely from one area? Where is the next generation of corals that is coming from? Where are the next generation of corals coming from that is going to recolonize other areas? So all of these things depend on the manner of exchange of individuals, of coral larvae. So at the larval stage, between one population and another. And it, apart from the ecosystem services, there's also the management aspect of this, where this type of scientific research is really important, as you will see later on. Okay, so understanding the linkages between dispersal and connectivity, gene flow and spatial genetic structure or population structure 
it could be a little bit complicated. And this is because real metapopulations or subpopulations are situated on complex land, landscapes. So as I just mentioned, we think of the ocean generally as humans, as a big bathtub, but in fact, the same way on land where we have different landscapes, valleys and rivers, different trees, different climates, different environmental variables, it's the same in the oceans. And what we find is some of these different variables can act as barriers or elements of fragmentation, also known as discontinuities. So some of these discontinuities, for example, gradients in temperature or salinity, geographic distance, oceanographic current patterns, and life history traits represent barriers to gene flow between populations. And current data indicates that strong ex extrinsic and intrinsic barriers to gene flow may exist in marine populations or marine systems that biologically meaningful genetic structure may be detectable. So given the physical and biological factors contributing to the variability um, in larval dispersal, we find that we need to um, have a very good understanding of the influence of these patterns on dispersal in order so that we could incorporate it into sustainable management of these populations in the future. And so I, um, I have come across a really good key paper that is so relevant to the type of research that I'm currently embarking on. It's a publication that was generated by Jim Underwood and his team in 2009, and it's entitled Ecologically Relevant Dispersals of Corals on Isolated Reefs Implications for Managing Resilience. And um, the research here pretty much shows, or the paper shows in general, that seascape dynamics is a main factor in influencing population structure of the corals. And it's been really evidenced in this paper. So the figure that you're looking at shows maps of major coral reef systems in Northwest Australia. And it also shows the sites where samples were collected from in this general district. So you had three site areas, Scott Reef, Rowley Shoals and the Browse Islands systems. And what you would have seen in the paper, the study undertook, or rather what the study did, was to use microsatellite data, um, which we'll talk a little bit more about, to measure the genetic structure and to infer the spatial scales of routine dispersal in two species of reef building corals of contrasting moods. So they looked at a brooder which is Theriotopora hystrix, and they also looked at a broadcasting species of corals, Acropora tenuis. Recall that we just mentioned before that life history and the mode of reproduction of the corals really do play a role in the dispersal or the ability to be exchanged between populations. However, it is not standalone. There would be other impacts that can sometimes affect the extent of their dispersal. And what was interesting is that the findings of this project really, or this research really supported three primary broad conclusions from previous genetic research on corals in the past. First, the differences in the reproduction mode of coral species are seen to really influence the levels of genetic subdivision. And that is congruent with expectations based on life histories levels of genetic subdivision among populations where you would find that um, subdivisions would be markedly higher in brooding corals as opposed to broadcasting spawners as i had previously mentioned before there's also a very clear distinction in the scale of genetic structure between the different systems so at the more geographically complex systems you would have found a much finer scale structure detected in both species and this suggested that hydrodynamics or um, other factors associated with these complex reef systems acted to restrict the distance or fragment the population. So restrict the distance between, um, or restrict the distance that is regularly traveled by these larvae. That's what I wanna say. Um, the primary implication therefore in this situation is that if there's some sort of impact that the short-term recovery of these coral communities 
after some severe disturbance, again, for example, like the hurricanes, would require some input of larvae from a viable community elsewhere, probably like a few kilometers to tens of kilometers away. Okay, so in terms of being self-sustaining, it has been suggested in this paper that coral reef protected areas need to be large enough to really encompass these routine dispersal distances. So hence my project is really trying to do something in a similar fashion where we are trying to determine areas as a result of laval dispersal, those areas that are seen to be of more ecological importance, um, perhaps act as source sink areas, nursery and spawning grounds for corals so that we can have a better definition of how to better manage these areas or better define the areas of this type of ecological importance. And although we spoke so much about the importance of connectivity, what we would have found is that planktonic dispersal in itself really remains a big black box. And this is because you have larger marine species that you could attach a satellite transmitter to them and they are easy to be followed. But you can do the same with a planktonic organism, obviously, because of their microscopic size. So what we have found is that genetic methods, using genetic methods or using DNA, is one of the more appropriate approaches or techniques that can be used to properly measure spatial and even temporal um, differentiation between populations of these coral species. So genetic methods, they have various conceptual and practical advantages and are commonly utilized, as I said, in these types of researches. But you, know, you have to be very careful in how the, the data is applied as well as interpreted. And this is one of the things that I am still yet to discover um, as part of this project because I have not even begun to delve into the utility of these methods and the markers that I'm going to use for sure. So in essence, genetic divergence of the populations really arise through isolation. The degree of genetic differentiation, it provides insights into the degree of connectivity among these populations also. And if significant differentiation or variation is detected somehow in the neutral markers that are often used, you get an impression that, um, or well, neutral markers are those markers that are not affected by, affected by selection, by the way. So when you do see differences, it is often inferred that these differences are due to limitations in gene flow or restrictment, restrictions to dispersal. In other words, those types of discontinuities that I had mentioned before. Also, what is very important is that high rates of gene flow and potential for occasional long distance dispersal in marine species can often undermine accuracy of these parameters. And so in order to really obtain robust estimates of laval connectedness from genetic data, you have to try to minimize, as in any research, minimize the sources of error um, as far as possible related to the genetic signal in this instance. And in order to do that, detailed, explicit sampling designs need to be designed or need to be implemented together with really sensitive markers that can utilize individual genotypes as the units of analysis in this type of study. And so now we kind of jumping into my PhD <laughs> and its um, relevance to sustainability in the Caribbean. Um, so given all that I mentioned before in terms of the declines of coral health in the Caribbean and worldwide, you would find that managers are particularly really interested in determining the distances that are relevant to the persistence and sustainability of the scleractinian or reef building corals that form the 3D structure of coral reefs. So in my PhD, um, we will be looking at the utility of state-of-the-art high-resolution genetic markers to infer the connectivity patterns of reef building corals or scleractinians 
um, with different reproductive modes also. So I'll be looking at brooders as well as broadcasters. Um, and we would also be looking at the different seascape characteristics that determine their method or their extent of dispersal. So the focus of this study will be to elucidate the seascape determinants of population structure and genetic connectivity in the marine environment. So to this end, we will also utilize DNA microsatellite markers. We will employ about 20 of them. 20 of them will be developed for each of these species. Um, probably not mustard hill because there might actually be the possibility that they've been developed in previous studies. And so it's not, it might not be necessary to repeat them. But again, it all depends on the quality of those markers that had been previously developed. So if we find that they were, yeah, then we, it would be in our best interest to redevelop very good and very new ones. So anyway, so we would use DNA microsatellites to quantify the genetic structure of the brooding golf ball, as well as the mustard hill corals and the broadcasting grooved and symmetrical brain corals, which are run over a little later um, in the presentation. So yeah, and we'll be looking at the, we'll be looking at quantifying genetic structure of these species within and among a set of reef systems of the islands of the Dutch Caribbean, Southern Dutch Caribbean. So when I speak of Southern Dutch Caribbean, I speak of the islands that make up the ABC, which is Aruba, Bonaire, as well as Curacao. So what is great about studying this area is that this area is a vast system of interconnected reefs. As you can see in the um, diagrams that I've posted here, the islands are in close proximity with one another, but still separated by very deep waters, and they are all connected by ocean currents. So they share the North Equatorial currents as well as the Guyana currents, which flow from east to west. And they have this unique geographic isolation about them that really presents an opportunity for clear, measurable genetic signals in terms of differentiation between and even within the systems that are there. So it allows us to estimate from genetic data um, the distances over which the vast majority of the larvae routinely recruit and therefore we are able to measure or we will be able to measure the spatial scales of um, demographic or individual independence among communities. I would think that it is a very suitable environmental experimental system in the Caribbean for studying these patterns of connectivity and gene flow under um, a metapopulation context and also under different seascape influences because of the dynamics in play in this particular region. And of course, it helps that it is an area that is generally, well, at least Aruba is very understudied in terms of this type of scientific information. So this slide, I'm not gonna go through in too much detail because I've all shared the presentation, I've shared the presentation with you all so you could look over it in your own time. But basically it shows the status of reefs in the ABC. It shows the types of corals the, that you find in each of the areas, the use of the coastal zone, past and present threats that I already mentioned to you. And it also shows the response of the coral or the different habitats to these threats. What is interesting about this slide is that it currently shows or it shows the type of management or the extent of management that currently takes place in these three islands here. So from the least managed or the, yeah, the least managed um, coral, not coral, marine habitat areas would be in Aruba. So there's only been a recent plan for MPA development in Aruba to Bonaire, which is very aggressive or has been very aggressive in terms of its management over the years. In fact, it is one of the best, if not the best managed marine protected area in the Caribbean, and it really acts as a model for sustainable conservation for many parts of the, or many other MPAs in the Caribbean as well as worldwide. So it shows the different levels of management between these three countries, and therefore research like this can further lend to um, 
a difference in management, better management, or whatever is the needs of that particular island in a sustainable development frame work. Okay, so the objectives, therefore, of my PhD research are the following. Um, I'll be looking at assessing the contribution of neutral genetic structures. So this is um, structure without selection pressures and the spatial pattern of two broadcasting species. And I mentioned them before and I will do it again later on. And in this instance, we hypothesize that the populations of broadcasting species that spawn their gametes externally and whose larvae develop within the plankton are generally less genetically subdivided and are under higher selection pressure than their brooding conspecifics. Objective two is pretty much where I assess the contribution of um, FST in the spatial patterns of brooders, where the hypothesis in this instance is the opposite where we think that the brooders that um, when they release their larvae, they will be generally more genetically subdivided and under lower selection pressure than their broadcasting conspecifics. Um, and the third objective here, we hypothesize that the dispersal of larvae is asymmetric and it would be pretty much that expected that the eastern populations would act as propagule sources for western populations of corals simply just based on the direction of Caribbean currents. So in this instance we are looking at the currents as one of the main players in terms of seascape dynamics and we would also be looking at areas that can therefore act as areas of ecological importance in the ABC so a source sink dynamic spin on things as well. Um, I mentioned ocean currents, but in this particular objective, we would also be looking at things like um, habitat structure, coastal zone use, uh, some of the physical chemical parameters um, in terms of um, water quality, uh, oxygen, that sort of thing. Also to help determine what are some of the environmental factors that influence the dispersal of lava among the ABC, within and among the ABC. And finally, we would also be comparing seascape influences on the genetic population structure of broadcasting, spawning, and brooding coral species, where we hypothesize that habitat structure and currents also influence the dispersal, excuse me, of the population structure of scleratinians in the ABC as well. So briefly, and in a nutshell, these are the four objectives of this PhD research. And here, this is why it's important to the Caribbean. I'm going to reiterate this again. It really, really is going to add to knowledge of coral reef ecosystems, especially in terms of connectivity in the Caribbean region, and even lead to further avenues for scientific study. Because I did mention briefly that in Aruba, Coral reef and marine ecosystems are generally very understudied. And so this project so far has really shown to open doors, not only for myself, but for other scientists coming behind me to really conduct very sound and robust research in this area. And it's really needed, especially in terms to impact and inform better management of these systems. The project is going to use um, standard ecological methods as traditional ecological sampling methods as well as these state-of-the-art molecular and statistical tools. Um, I am a marine biologist primarily and this is a growing opportunity for me in this regard because many marine biologists are now getting into the um, frame of mind of using other approaches from outside the discipline in order to have a better understanding of how systems work within marine habitats and evolutionary science and molecular science is one of those avenues. So it's a learning experience, as I said, even, you know, now. And also this project will address sustainable development goals, particularly goal 14, which is to conserve sustainable conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. So um, here truly highlights the importance of this study to the Caribbean region. 
Um, this slide also, again, I wouldn't go into too much detail about it, but it shows the coral species that I have identified for study. What I will say about the species and why I have chosen this species is that studies by DeBacca and his team in 2016, um, they have been monitoring coral reefs in Bonaire and Curacao for sure for some time, for a really long time, since 1973 to about 2014. And what they have found is that there's an overall shift between shallow and upper mesophotic reefs from large structural species as the Orbicella um, to the dominance of smaller opportunistic species. And as I mentioned, again, there was like a drastic decline in the dominant species. And what was left behind mainly, so due to this overall shift from dominant corals to opportunists, um, and these corals here that I've listed are basically some of the opportunists that you find on many Caribbean um, reefs. You would have seen that even though there was an, a, a decline of these types of species as well, they are the ones that you see mainly on reefs today. So it shows that there is something, even though that there's been an overall loss, that there's something about these particular species of corals that allow them to be very resilient. And their presence and abundance on reefs today really indicate that they are generally more stable and withstand changes in the environment a lot better than the larger dominant species. And therefore, I believe it's very possible that these types of species might actually be the future of corals as a foundation species. And so this is why we are looking into these types of species on a more um, rigorous basis because they seem to be the ones that are faring a lot better than their more, their larger and more developed counterparts. So the ecological importance of these species as reef builders, as well as their association with some other species as well, to me makes them really suitable subjects of study. Um, so I've divided my work into four work packages. Um, again, not gonna go through it in so much details, but I put it up here because I know some of the um, younger students and even P um, the older PhD students such as myself would just generally like to see how the work will be organized or its intent to be organized. And I've div divided my work into four main work packages where the first work package, I'll be looking to try to obtain as much data from previous, and I've already begun to do so, previous as well as current um, sources related to spatial patterns and population structure, both brooders and broadcasters. I'll also be collecting field samples of these coral species using the laceration regeneration assay technique. I wanna talk a tiny bit about that before I go, because it's, I think it's quite interesting. And um, we also will be looking, as I said before, developing and testing some of these DNA markers that we will um, create in order to measure the genetic structure of these corals. And um, we would also, of course, integrate, store and integrate the data, compile all of it in a manner that is easily accessible and very cohesive. So, oh, and we do this for both brooders and broadcasters. So work package one is kind of like for dedicated to broadcasters, work package two would be the same techniques, but except that we'll be looking at the brooders, as I did mention before in the objectives, yeah. So the laceration regeneration assay is a technique that has been developed by um, scientists that have collaborated with NOAA. And it's basically a very simple low cost technique that is minimally invasive because I'm sure some of you are wondering how are the coral sampling gonna take place, et cetera. So in this technique, you basically use a leather punch um, to puncture a very tiny and measurable amount of coral from the parent colony. And therefore, you get a piece of coral that is uniform in size every time. 
of a known size so that the known size of the coral lesion left behind is um, known, um, which makes it very important for monitoring their health in terms of healing in the future. So I'm gonna whiz through that and continue with work packages three and four. So work packages three will basically look at the spatial genetic structure and connectivity of sclerotinians between and within systems of the ABC islands. And in this instance, we would use a whole suite of statistics as well as genetic components to measure the amount of genetic variation, determine genetically differentiated clusters, um, determine pathways of migration for some of these coral larvae. And finally, with package four, we would be looking into the seascape influences on the genetic populations of both broadcasting and broad, brooding and broadcasting spawn of corals. All of this work will be done, all of the genetic sampling or some of the genetic sampling, most of it, will be done under the supervision of my advisor, my primary advisor of this project. His name is Prof Professor Philippe Volcat, and he is the head of the Lab of Biodiversity and Evolutionary Genomics at Caio Leuven. So their lab has over, and the team at that lab has over 30 years of experience with about um, about fundamental and really strategic evolutionary research strategies on marine organisms. So they've worked through projects such as Marine Genomics Europe, Aquatrace, etc. And through his lab and under his training, there will be exchanges of between me and perhaps even other students who are located at the Kaya Levin to be trained in these fields and in these techniques that I'm not yet familiar with. So that's one of the avenues under which I will receive my training to learn about some of the molecular techniques and analyses that will be used in this type of study. And through his advice, advice, advice <laughs> as well, I would also continue to do what I'm doing at the moment, which is teaching biology at the University of Aruba to undergraduate students as part of the system program. So this is the relationship between, one of the relationships between Caio and UA in this, in terms of this project. So this study is applicable in a variety of different ways. There are all of these management agencies and institutions that are associated with the islands of the ABC and as I mentioned before, findings of this research can really inform better management to um, the agencies in Aruba, Bonnie, as well as in Curacao. And overall, I expect to also contribute to the development and impl implementation of policies at a regional level, continue to build capacity among myself as a student and other students, regional stakeholders under the system program, and um, to create more public understanding and fundamental knowledge of the subject areas of marine science, and to have a low cost effective coral reef monitoring strategy under our belt moving forward if we intend to keep monitoring our reefs on a long-term basis. So um, through this project, we have also enhanced our stakeholder and scientific network, which is really, really, really crucial and the study involves support and collaboration by these regional government and non-governmental institutions that I've mentioned here, as well as scientific partners at various levels in research. So you find that these persons have been contributing um, scientific knowledge, knowledge in terms of acquiring permits, and basically how to interpret and disseminate results when, they, when we come by them, assistance sampling, etc. And you would find that this network is so important in building and fostering a long-term strong marine science network that is sorely needed in the Caribbean to facilitate future types of projects in this way. So it is our hope also that through these and other projects like this, even you guys at um, HMSC can be involved 
as well as, you know, let there be an exchange of knowledge and partnerships between the two institutions moving forward. And this project is one of these avenues that I can foresee this taking place. Um, this slide speaks about the outreach that I intend to embark upon as part of this project, hopefully by helping to develop a marine science education program at the UA, continue my work with local NGOs, such as um, a coral restoration group known as Scubble Bubbles in Aruba, and um, Aqua Windies as well, which is a dive institution there. And to continue my efforts in doing these types of public presentations and seminars, um, I'm also working with um, an organization known as COST, which is European Cooperation in Science and Technology. Um, and they have a project there known as C Unicorn, which stands for Unifying Approaches to Marine Connectivity for Improved Resource Management for the Seas. So my findings of my study will contribute to the network of information that is available on um, a program like this, C Unicorn. And I believe this brings me to the very end of my presentation. I'm sorry that it was so long, but I hope it was helpful and useful in a variety of ways. Um, thanks very much to my advisors. Um, that's Professor Dr. Philippe Volkart, as well as Dr. Eric Mitz and all advisors and collaborators locally and internationally, so all of those that I mentioned before in the previous slides, as well as my fellow system team members, who as I mentioned also have extremely exciting and invigorating projects in their own right. And to my loving family, my husband Michael and our daughter Johanna Honnett, um, they are constantly a rock of support in these um, ventures and thank you to all of you at HMSC for having me today and to listening to my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. Uh, would like to open up the floor for uh, any questions uh, from anyone online. Please go ahead and ask them in the chat. And while that is happening, I will also post uh, information yeah, about. Speaker. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is this is Bob Cowan. Um, uh, just want to thank you very much. I thought you gave a very thorough overview of of the issues and, and the science, um, and I particularly like your plans to apply it to MPA design and, and policy as as well as of uh, your plans to for public outreach. I mean, you, it, it's an impressive overall project. Um, so I congratulate you on on your planning on that. I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, you gave a nice example of this sort of study with Underwood et al. Mm -hmm. And it seems you have kind of a comparable system that you can sample from through the different uh, ABC um, uh, locations are, are they are they that sort of same level of scale several hundreds of kilometers uh, apart uh, in terms of their distance they are not that um, they are not that wide in terms of distance you find them to be a lot more close uh, in terms of distances nautical miles and whatnot but the seascape factors, the different seascape habitats that you find there are different. So in that sense, it, makes, it still makes sense to kind of measure them from a seascape perspective because we do know that there are different influences that still impact these islands apart from them being fairly distant from one another. But the scales of distance in the two contexts are indeed quite different. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I was also thinking about the, do you, what do you know about the larval duration of the oh, four different species you're looking at? What, what's the larval duration of the four species you're looking at? The larval duration, um, I cannot say what it is offhand at the moment. 
I do have, I did kind of like make up a little file with all of that information, but I genuinely can't remember it offhand. What I will say is that for each of the species, the larval duration is, of course, different. Their spawning times and all of that are also highly dependent on the species. And this is one of those things that I need to really look into to familiarize myself a lot more in terms of going forward. Okay. Well, very good luck with it all. It was a great study. Looks Thank like you. Really Thank you very much. And also, I'll just say hello to Eric. Nice <laughs> to see you, Eric. And I'm really happy that we're seeing this program get into this stage and working with each other. Well, Bob, very nice to, to hear your voice again. And looking forward to seeing you again one day uh, when the uh, borders open up again. <laughs> that sounds good. Okay, any other questions from folks uh, online? Um, I don't see any in the chat at the moment. I, I do have one question for you, Diana. So um, uh, with this project, how many other, how many other graduate students or how many other, yeah, how many other graduate students are, are working on projects um, in, from University of Aruba uh, in the same kind of uh, stream of, of support? So in total, we are eight at the moment. There is funding for 11 students, but at the moment we are eight. And we all work under some discipline of STEM. So as I mentioned before, you have persons that are working on um, seawater um, techniques in terms of valorization, wastewater management, um, waste management, vertical farming, um, GIS, etc. But my project is the one that is primarily targeted to, targeted to marine science in itself. So um, coral reef, marine science, etc. But in all, there are eight of us, and hopefully our team will grow within the next few months. So um, I'm not. Uh, terribly, I, I'm a bit ignorant of the marine science around University of Aru or around the island of Aruba and, and that whole region and, and the coral reefs. Um, how much work has been done? I mean, it, you know, it seems like uh, it seems like it it would be really prudent to to look into doing more of what you're doing uh, there. Uh, but there, uh, at the moment, doesn't seem to be a, a terrible amount of research on, on those coral reefs. Yes, um, and there, I believe there are a variety of different reasons for that. For instance, the, to obtain the permissions to get a sample in some of these areas alone is a complete headache. Mm -hmm. So I know that there have been persons locally that have tried or made attempts to even just get permissions to sample on sampling on reefs and they've run into some problems, which kind of just, you know, like threw them off from doing their research altogether. Um, also, because we are a, a very small island, a lot of the resources that would help to make a study like this is not possible. So I did mention that part of this, um, a huge part of this project would be my exchange under the system program to go to Caillou um, loving in order to to learn some of the lab techniques to do the majority of my analyses there and it's because of collaborations like this that these types of projects are able to get on the ground because we really don't have the local capacity right now in terms of resources having said that through this program thus far um, and in my project alone it's expected that we are going to build a genetics lab on island from scratch, right? Without any previous um, knowledge of, you know, what a genetic lab would entail and the type of work that it is able to be produced. So it's through these collaborations, as I mentioned, that things are now starting to open up. And as I said, not just for myself, hopefully for persons coming behind me as well. This is in Aruba. By the way, a lot of the resources seem to be a bit tight. In Bonnie and Curacao, things have been a little better. The areas are more widely researched, and there are even institutions that are internationally known for producing amazing work in marine science, such as Kamabi. 
um, they are Caribbean um, institution based in Curacao. And also I mentioned the amazing work that Bonnet is doing in terms of their management. So they have been a bit more vigorous in terms of their marine science explorations, but in Aruba, it is still building. And I see this as a really awesome avenue for opening up the scientific gaps that are here. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, um, I'm wondering if there are any more questions online. If not, I, I know you're going to meet with our students uh, following this. So maybe we'll give you a five minute break before that. Um, if there are no other questions, I want to thank again, everyone for joining us today and remind everyone again, I just posted the um, uh, Science on Tap next week uh, on Wednesday, Virtual Science on Tap. Uh, that's with uh, Claudia Parrish, I'm sorry, Julia Parrish, uh, uh, talking about COVID clouds and silver linings, the value of citizen science in a pandemic. I uh, also want to highlight that uh, next week we will have Carmel Finley talk about the history of Belshamada uh, and uh, the uh, impact of, uh, of basically uh, Japanese scientists to ocean science and development of recruitment fisheries oceanography. So uh, please, it should be a very uh, a wonderful uh, talk just like today. All right, thank you very much. And thank you again, Diana. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Take Anybody? care, all of you. Thank you. Bye. I'm going to raise it.